Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Eborn, and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and, and participating in our vision screening uh, webinar. We're discussing vision screening tools uh, for children aged uh, from birth to age three. And today we have with us Dr. K. Nottingham Chaplin, we have Kira Baldonado, and we have Donna Fishman, uh, who are with the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness. And we thank uh, Dr. Chaplin, uh, Kira Baldonado, and Donna Fishman for joining us and for their time in bringing this information for you today. Um, I'd like to turn, or I'd like to talk about a few things before I turn the time over to Donna to begin the presentation. Um, first of all, we will not be taking audio questions during the webinar, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. Feel free to submit your questions anytime during the presentation, and we will take the questions in the order that they are received uh, after the presentation. Our, present our presenters will take about 45 minutes uh, for today's presentation, after which we will begin to answer questions. Um, this webinar will be recorded, and a link to the recording will be posted on our schoolhealth.com site, as well as our YouTube channel, and we will email a copy of the recording out to everyone for future playback. Everyone who attends today's webinar will also be receiving a certificate of attendance for joining us today and you should expect to receive that in three to four business days. Um, and, and the reality is we will probably get those out this afternoon, but uh, just in case we have a technical issue on our side, um, we will have it out you know, as soon as we possibly can. And then lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please contact GoToWebinar directly at 855 three five two nine zero zero three and again that number for go to webinar is eight five five three five two nine zero zero three and now i will turn the time over to donna fishman great thank you so much ryan and thank you to school health for sponsoring this webinar today i'm donna fishman and on behalf of my co-presenters, Kira Baldonado and Kay Nottingham Chaplin, we want to thank all of you who are participating. We know it's a difficult time right now, and we know many of you are caring for young children, either in person or via Zoom, via phone or friendly visits from your cars. We appreciate you taking time from your day to spend with us to learn about the importance of children's vision and eye health and ways you can be sure to screen children effectively to make sure they have clear vision to enable them to reach all of their developmental milestones, gain early literacy skills, and be able to experience their whole world with clear vision. Your presenters today work with the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health at Prevent Blindness. Prevent Blindness is a 112-year-old patient and patient advocacy organization, bringing people of all ages to eye care and helping them live their best lives. The National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health was established in 2009 to build a comprehensive program of vision and eye health for all children. We provide parent and caregiver education resources, education training and technical assistance for professionals, and guidance for conducting evidence-based vision screening and strategies for ensuring that children who do not pass vision screening get the eye care that they need, as well as glasses and other treatments. We would like to thank the Maternal and Child Health Bureau of the Federal Resources, Federal, excuse me, the Federal Health Resources and, and Services Administration for their funding support of the National Center. At the outset, we want to let you know that we are working with many national partners, including the CDC, to develop guidance for implementing vision and eye health program administration under new distancing concerns. We know many of you have questions about how do I do a vision screening with six foot distancing rules. I'm happy to tell you that one of the tools you will see today, the 18 vision developmental milestones from birth to baby's first birthday, you can use during a telephone or video call as you talk with parents and caregivers and through observation if you're able. We are gathering questions from the field about conducting vision screening when programs and schools open in the fall. Please use the email that you see on the screen here 
and um, email me with your questions. We're going to be developing an FAQ along with the guidance, and it will be um, highlighted on our homepage. Um, I also want to let you know, again, again, remind you, you don't need to take notes because all of this information will be coming to you. So your presenters, I'd like to just more formally introduce us. I'm the director of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin is the Education and Outreach Coordinator of the Center. And Kira Baldonado is the Vice President of Public Health and Policy for Prevent Blindness and served for many years as the Director of the National Center. Dr. Kay is also a vision consultant to School Health and to Good Light. Wanted to let you know that we have nothing to disclose or any conflict of interest. Today's webinar has four objectives, all that will help you in your work with children and their families. You will leave this webinar with the tools you need to help detect early in a child's life a potential vision disorder. You will gain an understanding of the impact of uncorrected vision problems and the 18 vision developmental milestones that children need to reach in the first year of life. You will understand how to address a possible vision disorder and finally, you will learn about evidence-based approaches to vision screening, all in one hour. Of course, we can't cover everything, so we hope you'll visit our website for more information on other age groups that you might work with. I'll be back at the end of the webinar to talk some more about our resources. I'd now like to introduce Kira Baldonado. Thank you, Donna. And I'm just waiting to share my screen. Okay. I'd like to uh, begin my session by talking a little bit about what an evidence-based approach means. Um, I know that within the Head Start programs, early Head Start programs, and many community health programs, uh, we're, we're concerned that we're, we are utilizing evidence-based tools and procedures to make sure that we're identifying health problems early and making the po best possible recommendations for follow-up care. The National Center for Early Childhood Health and Wellness from the Office of Head Start defines evidence-based as an umbrella term that includes two things, the best research evidence, such as that found in health science literature, and clinical expertise, uh, such as what healthcare providers know from their experience. From the perspective of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health, we approach evidence-based tools and procedures uh, in a, a slightly refined way from that. Uh, we ensure that we can um, identify scientifically and peer-reviewed literature that outlines use of vision screening tools, procedures, and practices by the targeted audience that will be utilizing the tool in the targeted setting. So Head Start staff, uh, public health providers, in a, a child care setting. And so we're looking for literature that defines use of these tools in these settings with these individuals. We also want to make sure that the tools and practices that we're identifying are targeting the specific kinds of age appropriate uh, eye diseases and conditions that we'd like to identify early and refer on for comprehensive eye care. That they're referring those children, but they're also passing children appropriately if they do not have these conditions. So we're looking at the sensitivity and the specificity of the tools being used. Um, so for example, on the, the screen that you see in front of you, we, we go beyond just simply stating that a tool was used to screen 10,000 10, children. That alone does not make a tool evidence-based. What we're looking at instead is a peer-reviewed publication stating that the tool was used to screen uh, a large number of children, looking at ethnically diverse populations of children in community settings, and the screening results were compared to comprehensive eye examinations. And that's true for children that passed the screening and those that did not pass the screening. We wanna make sure that we're identifying children with the conditions and also those that pass appropriately as compared to the outcomes of a comprehensive eye exam. And so we wanna make sure that the tool correctly identifies 98% um, of children with vision disorders as an example of an evidence-based tool. So we're really looking at uh, what are the right methods, procedures, and tools that we can use at the right age with the right type of screener 
in the right kind of setting as we're approaching evidence base. So why is this important? Because vision problems in children, even at very young ages, are quite common. In the United States, we see about one in every 17 preschool age child and even up to one in every five Head Start child with a vision disorder that is requiring treatment. So imagine that there's two T-ball teams out on the field. Of those children out on the field, one of those children is going to likely have a vision problem that's requiring treatment. And here on the screen in front of you, you see the, the little fellow in the bottom picture with the yellow arrow pointing to him who does have a vision problem that needed to be corrected. So even in a small group of children, there is a child that uh, has a vision problem that hopefully is caught early and uh, detected early. If not, if it's not caught early, if it's not detected and treated early, it can lead to permanent vision loss, uh, even if this little child is not found and treated before the age of seven years. So the assessments that you're doing, the conversations you're having, and the screenings you're providing really are critical to uh, a lifelong impact of healthy vision. And there are the references for the slide I just discussed. Beyond just the lifetime of vision, uh, it can also, vision problems can also impact a lifetime of development, behavior, and learning readiness. Research shows that there is a link between a child's health and their ability to develop properly and ability to perform well in school. Uh, vision specifically is included as one of the seven health barriers to learning. And research has shown that if vision problems are left undetected and untreated, those health barriers to learning can affect the child's ability to pay attention in class. They might be your happy wanderers that never seem to be focused on what you're doing. Be motivated to learn. Uh, be interested in what's in front of them and engaged. They may have problems maintaining co consistent attendance. They may learn not to appreciate the educational environment and may fight actually going to school. Performing well academically. Uh, their vision issues can prevent them from achieving their full potential academically because of that barrier alone. And it can lead to issues uh, with, throughout the child's educational career, even impacting their ability to graduate high school. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kay Nottingham Chaplin. Okay. Okay, thanks, Kira. So what I want to start with, um, a few studies of older children, just to give you an idea of how uh, undetected and untreated vision early on is impacting those children. Um, so, and to show the goal of screening children as soon as you can. So this first one was, it was a study that was published in 2015, looking at low income children ages three through five years. And this study found that after vision screening, eye exam and treatment, um, there was an improvement in academic progress. There was an improvement in children's confidence and behavior. There was an increase in uh, their focus during lessons, classroom participation, and interaction. And I have three additional studies to show you because we, we intuitively know that if a child is not seeing clearly, that is going to impact um, their learning and other other conditions such as development and the research is starting to emerge to actually support this in, intuitive thought. So another study published in 2015, 17, looked at 317 second and third graders in 12 high poverty schools in Baltimore City and researchers found that children with uncorrected hyperopia, which is sparsightedness, that those children with uncorrected hyperopia did not perform as well on reading assessments when compared with children without hyperopia. 
a 2016 study published in the UK looking at children ages four and five at school entry found poor visual acuity was associated associated with reduced literacy. An example is difficulty naming letters. And another study published in 2015 looked at Head Start children ages four and five years, and these were thousands of children, uh, with hyperopia of four or more diopters of hyperopia. And these children scored significantly worse on an early literacy test than children with normal vision. So I want to give you an example because when we say four diopters of hyperopia, we don't sometimes know what that means. So this is an example of full vision. This is an example of four degrees, uh, four diopters. So you could see why that would make it a little difficult to be able to identify letters. So a diopter is defined as the um, strength of the prescription lens that is needed to give a child the clearest vision possible. And when you're looking at diopters, the higher the number, the stronger the prescription lens. So a child requiring four diopters of correction and either prescription glasses or contact lenses would likely struggle, as you just saw in that example, would likely struggle with blurred vision, with crossed eyes because they're trying to focus, or both, and would see much better with prescription glasses. These are the references for those studies, and when you download or see the slides and you want to take a deeper dive, um, these are the references for those studies. So how is clear vision helpful for children overall? Um, helps with healthy development. Clear vision obviously helps with the ability to learn because if you, again, have trouble seeing these letters, it would be difficult to um, describe them, to name them. Um, enhances a, chil a child's self-esteem and confidence. Clear vision is also helpful for athletic ability and improved behavior. And we have an entirely different lecture on classroom behaviors that um, can be associated with vision disorders. But the bottom line here is that by screening vision and screening vision with evidence-based tools and procedures, you, everybody who's on here, you play an important role in helping to make sure children have clear vision. So now I want to talk about the tool that Donna described that's looking at the key vision development milestones in year one. Now, some of you may have seen or even used earlier versions. And this is the May 27th, 2020 version. And I will show you in just a moment where you can download um, this tool for each child in this age group that you serve. So some advantages are improved instructions. And this is based on user input. And we are very appreciative of user input. So when you download this and use it and you find something that could be changed, let us know. Uh, we have updated guidance and examples. Um, screen or signature area on the bottom of each page just in case um, screeners change but you still want to use the same document. And a data collection form which I will show you. And it's also um, available in Spanish. So this is an example of the first sheet and you will see that it has 18 milestones. Some had five, some had seven. So you want to make sure that your version is 52720. So if you have an older version, download the newer version. This is um, an example of that same sheet in Spanish. 
we encourage you to download one document per child and to use this tool um, throughout the year. And again, this is a tool that you could use now, but if your center's closed, obviously not. But whenever, when, when we start opening up, this is a tool that you can use over the phone during video calls with parents and caregivers. And as a reminder, we will have um, screening during COVID-19 uh, later this summer. So this is where you can find uh, the developmental milestones. You'll see the English and the Spanish versions. Again, you don't need to write the URL. This will be in the uh, material you receive later. So when you're looking at these milestones, please know that because each child is different that the milestones can vary up to six weeks except a milestone that's related to straight eyes and that one needs to um, occur during the month that you see it. The, slide show, uh, the slides will show when the baby should reach the milestones and many of these milestones are related to overall developmental milestones but I want you or we want you to think about these vision milestones from that perspective of vision and it's something we don't always think of when we're looking at developmental milestones that perhaps vision could be a reason that the child is lagging. So here is an example of uh, the first milestone and you will see the age and again a reminder that they vary up to six weeks. You'll see the actual milestone. Some will have one, some will have two or three or four. You'll see questions. You'll also have the opportunity to say yes or not yet and let's rescreen within six weeks a date for the rescreening but if no after rescreening, then you move to next steps. And here you will see that the next steps column also includes activities for parents and caregivers. Um, the idea is that you would start the document at the first milestone, regardless of the child's age, to ensure that the child has met all vision milestones up until that age and then if possible use the document each month. So here's an example of that same page in Spanish and here is another example during the second and third months and I just wanted to pull out a couple. So baby makes eye contact with the parent or caregiver is one and baby has a social smile is another one. And now I have some videos which may or may not have sound, but I think you'll get the idea. And these are examples of what you want to see versus what you may see if a baby is not maintaining stable eye contact or has no social smile. And in this first one, you will see mama in the right hand just barely see her in the right side of the screen, but she's talking to, to baby. So um, again, a reminder, you may or may not have sound. So that was clear eye contact, clear social smile. So here's an example of the opposite. So no matter what mama's trying to do, baby's ignoring her. And if you'll notice the sibling has glasses on, that's always a red flag. So now mama's trying other ways to engage baby. Still not working. 
So now let's look to see what happens once we correct the vision. I think that was the first time that baby ever really saw mama. Up until that point, mama's face was just sort of a blur. And I have watched this video a hundred times, I think, and I have chill bumps every time. Melts my heart. Okay, so this is an example of the documentation form. You have each question, the screen date, whether it was a pass or refer, the race screen date, whether it was a pass or a refer. So that's for each question. These are the expert contributors who assisted with developing this tool. And these are resources that were consulted to develop this tool. And I will now turn this back over to Kira, who will describe screening for children ages uh, one and two years. Kira? All right, thank you, Kay. Let me share my screen here. Hopefully everybody can see that. And I want to talk about um, beyond that first year where you had the opportunity to utilize the 18 developmental milestones for vision. Um, what can we do for children uh, ages one year and two years uh, old? And there are really two approaches that you can provide for vision screening, uh, meeting that vision screening requirement in this age group. Uh, you can certainly have a report from the child's primary health care provider, the pediatrician, the family practice provider, uh, that they conducted a vision evaluation in the clinic and provided results. Uh, and then quite often also, uh, you're not able to get that report from the primary health care provider. So we need an additional way that we can look at children's vision within this age group spe specifically. The other option for children ages one and two years old is an instrument-based vision screening. Um, and I do want to take a moment to point out uh, what the difference is between an instrument-based vision screening and what you might be doing with a uh, traditional appetite-based screen or chart-based screen. With an instrument-based vision screening, that tool, that device, is actually looking at the structure of the eye, uh, the, the shape of the cornea, um, the reflection that it gets from the back of the retina, the back of the eye, uh, to understand if there is a structural issue that may be prevalent in that child's eye that may indicate a possible vision problem, um, a possible refractive error, um, misalignment of the eyes. Uh, it does not, however, um, analyze how the child's brain is interpreting the vision, visual image that it's receiving from the eye itself. Um, so that's not something that, that an instrument-based vision screen. Uh, but they have worked with these devices quite a bit to make sure that at least those structural indicators of a possible eye problem um, are referring children as appropriately as possible. Um, now, typically, uh, an instrument-based vision screen will provide you um, an assessment of structural problems that may lead to amblyopia, which is loss of vision in one eye because of some condition in that eye, causing the brain to basically shut it off. Um, so typically, risk factors that might lead to amblyopia include estimates of significant refractive errors, that's your, your farsightedness, your nearsightedness. Um, astigmatism, which many of us have, um, it can also provide you with an estimate of anisometropia. And that is a difference in refractive error between the two eyes of the child. So uh, both eyes could be farsighted, but one could be significantly more farsighted than the other. Or one eye might be nearsighted and the other eye farsighted. So that's a different kind of refractive error between those two eyes um, and very difficult for the, the brain to comprehend what's going on uh, when you have a significant difference in that refractive error. And an instrument-based vision screening can al also provide you an estimate of eye misalignment. So um, typically referred to as uh, a cross eye or a, a strabismus is the more technical term. Is there some deviation in the alignment of the eye that can cause a uh, double image, blurred image for that child's brain to be trying to interpret on a regular basis? 
And certainly, um, if that's allowed to continue and it's not treated uh, properly, then the brain will have to take steps to overcome some of these issues that it's seeing and, and basically will shut off one of the eyes, leading to amblyopia. So the, the guidance uh, on the appropriate ages for use of instrument-based screening were developed uh, and, and currently exist from 2016 published guidelines developed in consensus by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and American Association of Certified Orthoptists. Now, these groups together um, designate that an instrument-based vision screening can be used beginning at age 12 months, preferably 18 months if that's possible, and then through the ages of one and two years. Uh, these policy guidelines go on to say, uh, for those of you that screen in preschool age population, that an instrument-based vision screen is, is one of the approved approaches as well as an optotype-based approach for um, children ages three, four, and five years old. The National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health regularly uh, reviews these types of devices uh, again, looking at uh, an evidence-based approach, as I discussed at the beginning of this presentation. So we're making sure that the devices that we have the opportunity to review are appropriate for the ages listed um, and the types of settings that they will be targeted for use by the types of individuals uh, that will be conducting the screening. So we really do look um, pretty intensely at the published peer-reviewed evidence uh, and make sure that they are going to be appropriate for the defined ages and settings. And you can find the results of these reviews on the, the website for the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. And I encourage you to go on there on a regular basis, uh, maybe a couple of times a year, just to see if there are any updates to those recommended tools uh, and devices that we maintain on that website. And with that, I will turn it over to Donna Fishman, who's going to talk about some of the resources available for you uh, to implement a strong vision screening and eye health program. Donna? Great. Thanks so much, Kara. And um, I'd like to thank Kara and Kay for so much valuable information in a short amount of time. Um, my job now is to talk with you about some of the resources of the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health that will help you in establishing and maintaining your own children's vision screening system of care. So to begin, this slide shows you how to find the 18 developmental milestones tool in both English and Spanish on our website. We were excited just a couple of weeks ago to launch a new and a new revised website with a navigation tool I think you'll find um, really helpful and that you will hopefully use often. And it's called Vision Screening Guidelines by Age, and Kay has that, um, it's highlighted here. On this page, you'll find guidelines broken down by age group, along with a variety of tools you'll need, including the milestones, as you see, circled here. Um, I just want to say, if, if you have, um, if you're serving children who speak a language other than English and Spanish, um, excuse me, the parents, please get in touch with us because we're happy to translate in, into other languages. And as I think Kay mentioned before, Kira, that we'd like to get your input. So please let us know. Um, you will also, on our, on our website, you're going to see a couple of different menus I wanna point out. One will be across the top and one will be on the left side. Um, and on that site, we just have so much information, we have to have those two menus. Um, one of the exciting things under technical assistance is that you can actually fill out a form online and tell us you'd like some help, that you'd like to know about evidence-based you know, evidence tools or how do I use this. Um, and so we're excited about that, that you could easily reach us that way. Also, you can download parent and uh, caregiver education resources and a slew of archived presentations from the past as well. And you can sign up for our e-newsletter that I've been sending out most recently with COVID information. From this page, you can also link to information on every kind of vision condition that would affect children, as well as the 12 components of a strong vision health system for children. I'm excited to show you these two resources that both are complementary to the 18 developmental milestones that you learned about today. On the left, you'll see a multi-page um, pamphlet or brochure really for 
uh, parents and it describes in detail in language that's understandable to parents about how their uh, newborn infant and toddler through age one up to age one, how their vision develops. And then in a, a much easier kind of visual on the right, you'll see our poster that you can use as, to le as a leave behind handout, as a reminder to parents um, and caregivers, but also to hang in a waiting room or on a bulletin board in a center. So we're excited about these tools and how easy they are to use. Okay, what you see here is our 12 components of a strong vision health system of care. We developed uh, these components and want you to know that the, the actual vision screening of uh, the actual checking the eyes is only one component out of the 12. We need to be sure the children who need eye care actually get there, that any treatment plans get communicated back to your screening program or early childhood center, and that parent education materials are at an appropriate literacy level and the languages they speak. All of these are part of the 12, the 12 components. Here's where you will find detailed information on everything from parent to caregiver education to coordinating vision screening referrals between your screening program, the child's primary care provider and an eye care provider to data collection and tracking and then evaluating your screening program. The National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health created a webpage in partnership with the National Head Start Association, specifically for early Head Start and Head Start programs called the Year of Children's Vision. You'll find information on vision screening, resources for parents and caregivers again, and vision screening guidelines and tools. I hope you'll take a look at the link, the Children's Vision Information Resources, Conference Presentations, and Webinars um, for all, for a lot of different resources. And then you could also link to the vision screening guidelines by age I just talked about from this page as well. What I'm showing here is a fact sheet that was created for Head Start centers. Um, and it's an important fact sheet that offers definitions of evidence-based vision screening and step-by-step -step guidance for establishing a strong vision screening program within Head Start centers. Their statute language, and the tips for educating parents and caregivers and the types of descriptions of evidence-based screening. It's a great tool to download and share with all of your staff. Here we see some resources to support uh, parents and caregivers. Um, you'll see links to our financial assistance programs, which are, can, be, can offer critical help to help children receive eye care. Prevent Blindness administers two financial assistance programs that you'll um, learn about in this fact sheet. Make sure to download the ABCs, which are appearance, behaviors, and complaints but about and from children that could indicate that the children might need to get eye care. This is a great resource for parents as well as for teachers and your whole staff. The National Center is partnering with, an, again, with the National Center, National Head Start Association to create an online resource, the Small Steps for Big Vision and Eye Health Information Toolkit for parents and caregivers to provide parents and caregivers with the information, suggested actions, and assistance they need to be empowered partners in their children's vision and eye health and to care for their own vision and eye health. We always wanna make sure that we're including information for the adults as well. The resources are relevant to Early Head Start, Head Start, and all other early childhood education and care programs that serve children ages birth to age five, through age five. The primary purpose of the kit is to give parents and caregivers information in an effort to reduce the gap between vision screening referrals and eye examinations, treatment, and follow-up examinations. Resources include presentation slides, many handouts, and social media messages programs can use to raise awareness about the importance of vision to learning. I want to let you know that we piloted the presentation with six Head Start centers and received positive feedback. All of the parents learned how they learned how vision impacts learning and their child's overall development and said they would take their ch children for care, eye care, if they didn't pass a vision screening. We're rolling out this toolkit via a national webinar on October 20th. So please visit the Small Steps uh, page to register to receive more information and, and then uh, see the invitation and registration for the webinar when it comes out. I want to introduce you here to our vision screening certification course. 
Um, we offer participants a three-year nationally recognized certificate based on current national guidelines and best practices on evidence-based vision screening tools and procedures, such as what you learned about today, for both preschool and school-age children. The course includes nine modules for an online self-study and then a personalized skills assessment with Dr. K. The benefits of certification are that students and children will receive consistent vision screening and follow-up procedures when they do not pass a vision screening. And all screeners within programs and school districts will screen consistently using evidence-based tools. The course covers common vision disorders in children, how to use evidence-based and age-appropriate tools, how to enhance your screening programs to improve follow-up eye care, and how to gain access to other educational resources. Just to loop back again as a reminder about um, the COVID pandemic and vision screening, we are developing guidance. Um, our guidance will be broad and national in scope. And so we wanna remind you that you should be checking in with um, the CDC on the CDC site, and you should also be checking your community level Head Start, school districts, and state and local public health agencies. As part of our guidance, we will be issuing an FAQ document, and we encourage you to get your questions to us, keep in touch with us so that we make sure when we get that document together, we're answering your questions. So we'd like to um, thank you so much for participating in the webinar. I hope that you have achieved the objectives and learn more about the importance of children's vision and eye health and the importance of early detection and treatment for possible vision disorders. Please contact us if you have further questions. And now I'm pleased um, to turn the webinar back over to Ryan for some questions and answers today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Donna. And if I could ask you to just uh, continue to display this, this final slide while we're doing the, the question and answer period, in case anybody would like to be writing down these, uh, these email addresses or contact information. Great. All right. Uh, Great information. Uh, thank you, Donna. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, Dr. K. Um, we do have some questions that have come in, so I'll, I'll field them over to you. Um, we can take about 10 or 15 minutes to go through a few of these. Uh, the first one I will ask uh, uh, either Donna or Kira if you could give us an answer. Um, I've got Patricia who is asking if screeners have to be trained in vision screening and if early intervention providers who provide initial evaluations uh, may conduct screenings using the tools that you've talked about today. Go ahead, Kira. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. Um, so we do recommend that screeners go through uh, the certification course. Not only does it teach you about the proper ways to implement the vision screening tools themselves, and there are many practice methodologies that actually increase the validity of the test um, but also going through that training does provide you with many resources and practices that increase the likelihood that A, parents will understand what you're doing when you're doing vision screenings. Um, you have a stronger follow-up uh, after your referral from a, a vision screening when a child does not pass. And you have strong tools that you can utilize uh, to evaluate your program. So as Donna referred to those 12 components of a vision health program, um, those are all contained within the training itself. So we do recommend that individuals go through that because you'll really understand the full complement of implementing a vision and eye health program, not just screening with a vision screening tool itself. So there's a big difference there. Um, for early intervention specialists, I know that we have worked with um, several early intervention organizations to uh, identify some of the best practices for their program. Certainly uh, within the program itself or your national association, they may have specific guidelines and expectations. Certainly you would have to follow those, um, especially if there are state implemented guidelines, uh, which I know that we've worked with some states to develop guidance for their early intervention specialists. So what we need to first consider what professional and state level guidelines that you'll need to follow, and then what um, what some best practice and evidence-based methodologies you can utilize from the vision screening certification itself. So there's a few different factors to consider. Great, thank you, Kara. 
Um, for Dr. K, I've got uh, Corrine, who is a school nurse, and she is letting us know that part of her assignment is to assess incoming uh, three-year-olds with disabilities. And she's wondering what the best method might be to screen their vision when they are nonverbal uh, or they are unable to do a vision chart screening. She's asking if there are any evidence-based functional screening methods that may be available to her. Um, that is a great question. And I don't know that my answer will fit within your program so we could actually piggyback on what Kara said. But we at the National Center have recommendations that the children that um, there's a certain group of children who should actually bypass vision screening and go directly to an eye exam because their health conditions or developmental delays have a higher probability of having a vision um, disorder and it's better to get um, an ophthalmologist, developmental ophthalmologist, pediatric ophthalmologist, pediatric optometrist on the IEP, IFSP teams, even though they can't attend the meetings, but just, uh, and then get those kids in for an eye exam. If, however, you are required, and Kira, jump in at any moment, if you are required to do something, um, some kind of vision screening, and then that's when we can look at um, some other tools. Kira, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I would, thanks, Kay. I would just reiterate that uh, in some states, and, and we have had um, Prevent Blindness Affiliates work at the state level um, in those areas where there are state requirements that vision screenings rather than just a direct referral occur. Um, so certainly, you know, looking at those guidelines and if they've not been recently updated, um, you can certainly advocate for those to be updated and, and reconsidered. Um, in those cases where there are not state guidelines that you are required to follow, um, I would say the ear vision screening should um, include a referral to an eye care provider if there is not documentation that they had an eye exam in their record, um, or if they have an existing relationship with an eye care provider, make sure that that's documented and they've seen that eye care provider um, within the last year or two just to make sure everything's up to date. Uh, but children at increased risk of vision disorders because of developmental delay, um, uh, in utero exposure to uh, different uh, drugs or, or even cigarettes and um, premature birth. There are a lot of conditions that actually have an, a dramatically increased risk for a vision problem. And those are listed on the website for the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health. Those kiddos should really be connected to an eye care provider and have that relationship established. Uh, but like I said, in, in the event that your state has requirements, we can't simply supplant those um, by what we say today, but uh, we certainly want to work with states to provide some best practices based on current available research, and we're happy to do that. Okay, thank you, Dr. K, and thank you, Kara. Um, while we're uh, on this topic, um, I, I heard you mention earlier instrument-based screening, and I have Margaret, uh, who has sent a question in, uh, letting us know that she works with uh, students that have a moderate to severe intellectual disability, uh, disability, I'm sorry, and that many times she will use the spot vision screener, um, but she is unable to read pupils that are too small, uh, even when she has the room uh, set fairly dark, fairly darkly. Do you have any suggestions uh, for how she might be more successful? Um, she's also saying that she has a hard time getting a reading uh, if the student does not focus. Do you have any suggestions that we can give to Margaret? Kay, do you want to take that first that I can add to? Um, I think that would go back to our recommendation of referring that child for an eye exam. Um, you tried the instrument and oftentimes instruments are um, used with with um, children who can't do other types of 
vision screening. So you've tried, you've, it sounds to me like you've done everything you could possibly do. And see, the problem is I don't know where you're from. I don't know what the access to an eye doctor is. Does your family, do your families have to drive two or three hours? Do they have to pay tolls? Do they have to, you know, I, there's so many variables to take into account, but that would be an ideal example of a child who should be referred for an eye exam, if that's possible. Kira, you want to add your comment? I think you said everything I was wanting to get in there. Um, so, yeah, he's definitely taking into account what the <laughs> love it. definitely taking into account the uh, the accessibility is a big issue. Um, and certainly we know of states where you may have two or three ophthalmologists serving the entire state. So um, programs that have different types of screening tools that are evidence based that they can utilize on a screen and rescreen basis before they're making the referral. Um, does tend to help out on reducing the number of referrals that don't need to be sent. And uh, then you can really focus on making sure that that family that has a referral gets access to care. What are their barriers? What might prevent them from following up on this referral? And do you need to engage other social service programs or community or public health programs that are out there that can work with you? And that's always something to consider. If you live in an area that has repeatedly, um, you know, poor access because of rural issues or, or um, urban issues without access to an adequate provider. Um, that's an opportunity to seek out and engage other public health organizations to say, you know, this is an issue in our community. Let's work together to overcome that. And maybe that is a, um, you know, a concerted effort by a university or a mobile vision clinic program or some other way that uh, we can make sure that vision care is getting to your community. And that's something that uh, the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health has been working on through a community of practice with specific areas. It's looking at what are some ways to overcome barriers to care. So there's a lot of good uh, best practice examples that we can pull from that work as well as um, other studies that we've referenced out there of, of ways to overcome barriers. We're really interested in doing that. Great, thank you, Kara. Um, for uh, Dr. K, we talked about the milestone uh, document, and Todd is asking, do we, and if so, how do we take birth prematurity into consideration uh, when we're, we're doing the screening? Excellent question. And when you look at, when you download the document, the instructions page on the right hand side, the right hand corner of the box of instructions is a formula for um, calculating and um, there's even a website that you can do the calculation and then it will explain how to use that adjusted age when looking at the milestones document. And if it is, if the instructions are unclear, um, please email me and that will be another version because we want that to be as clear as possible. So that's an excellent question, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, this one, uh, I think we, we've actually got a couple of different questions on this and I think that I might direct this to Kira. Um, for the spot vision screener and I've got uh, Kathleen who says she's using a SureSight machine. Um, they're, they're saying that they're reading information that say that you can start screening at six months with these instrument-based screeners, but uh, today you've discussed starting at one year. Can you talk to us about uh, the difference between um, the six months that the manufacturers are, are, are saying and the one-year time frame that we've discussed today? Sure, um, and that really goes back to um, my first slide. Uh, talking about evidence-based approaches and how we approach that at the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health, um, as well as the policy guidance that was developed in 2016 from that coalition of other health groups, the AAP, um, uh, the Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus Group, um, and others. So we're looking at um, peer-reviewed, published scientific literature that's showing the effectiveness 
of those types of tools in the, the Head Start setting and the, the community-based setting um, when it's appropriate to be utilizing those tools and what ages. So um, we're really uh, looking for the types of literature that's guiding us to say, okay, we know that there is validity in use of this tool for this specific age group. And uh, while we keep our eyes open for as much literature as possible, um, we've not yet found the scientific evidence to go younger than 12 months. At this point in time, um, certainly we want to encourage everybody in the manufacturer world as well as research world to keep looking at younger ages um, to make sure that we're providing the best guidance. But at this point in time, we don't have the, the scientific evidence to say um, there is a public health value in screening these younger ages with the referral criteria, with the settings, with the, the staff that's going to be doing it in a sound um, and valid way. But uh, like on a daily basis, we're still looking for more literature. And as we have um, enough evidence brought together, uh, we'll certainly adjust that and, and certainly update our website. But at this point in time, that's not available. I will say that the advisory committee for the National Center for Children's Vision and Eye Health is, um, has conducted a literature review in this age group as well as um, preschool and school age. Um, and we're actively working to update guidance, um, but right now we still need to see some more peer-reviewed scientific evidence that says this is a sound public health intervention at this very young age in um, non-clinical settings. Okay, thank you, Kara. Um, we've got time for one last question. I, I, I think that I might uh, refer this to Donna. Um, Judith is asking how many hours to earn a certification and do you know the co what the cost would be? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, the course typically takes between four and five hours um, to get through all the modules. It is, like I said, self-learning, self-paced, and um, you can stop and start. You have a link so you can stop and start as, as you will. Um, the total cost for the, um, for the course is $125. And again, it gives you a three-year certification. And then when your certification is ending, it's then $80 for a recertification. So the price definitely goes down as you um, after you've been certified and then recertifying. And if I can, this is Kay, if I can piggyback on to what Donna just said. Man, piggyback seems to be my favorite word today. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, we do have discounted rates beginning at groups of 10. In some uh, parts of the state, we're screening entire states of school nurses or we're screening entire districts or we're screening entire Head Start programs. So we do have discount, discounted rates at various levels beginning at a group of 10. Great, thank you, Dr. Kay. Okay, you said we're we're screening these different groups, we're training and certifying. So make I'm sure sorry. That, that folks, <laughs> I just want to make sure folks aren't um, going to try and have us run out and screen everybody, but uh, we're training oh, yeah. entire groups of uh, okay. individuals that she named. Thank you for that clarification. We've been talking about <laughs> screening, and I guess that was on my mind. Yes, the Prevent Blindness sure. Children's Vision Screening <laughs> Certification course. So yes, if you have large groups, um, know that we can accommodate large groups and we will even do the skills assessments through um, video calls doing multiple people at one time. Great. Okay. Well, thank you uh, both for the information on that last question. Um, that's all the time that we have to, for today. So I would like to give a big thank you for Donna Fishman. Uh, for Kara Baldonado and for Dr. K. Nottingham Chaplin uh, for bringing us your time and your information. Um, this, I think, was a really great presentation that, uh, that was really beneficial for everyone in the school health community. Um, just a, a couple of things for our audience. Um, we will uh, be sending out the slides from today's presentation. Uh, you will receive an email with a, a copy of the slides. We will also send you a link to watch this recording or share it with colleagues. Um, it will be hosted on our, on our YouTube channel and we will email that out as well. 
You will also receive by email a certificate of attendance for participating today. I know that many of you like to uh, use the certificate for uh, continuing education credits, and so we will provide that uh, so that you can do that uh, should your governing body allow um, that uh, to be used. Um, once you exit the webinar today, you will receive a survey that pops up on your uh, computer, and we'd ask that you uh, each please complete the survey and let us know how we did today, if there's information that you liked or if there's information that you would have liked to see but did not, um, please give us that feedback so that we can, uh, we can uh, keep these presentations uh, beneficial and, and providing good information for each of you. And uh, again, thank you for our presenters. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and end the presentation. Uh, have a good afternoon, everyone.